following up on the a point a little more, let me ask <clears throat> you, Dr. Tan, what about oligometastatic disease, right? A hot, a hot space, especially with PSMA PET. What do we do there? Right. That's, uh, you know, I think metastasis director therapy, and Chad can confirm, is really a hot topic across all GU tumor types and probably across all solid tumors, right? When we commit a patient to systemic therapy, that, that's an indefinite thing a lot of times, too. So if a patient uh, has oligometastatic disease, for example, maybe a few sites of disease, a rib med, a lymph node, et cetera, I think you know, this, this is an area where we need to explore um, sparing these patients uh, systemic therapy, uh, ADT. We may, we may prescribe it like it's, like it's candy, right? But in reality, ADT is pretty brutal for, for a man. You're taking away um, their, their sexual function, they're getting hot flashes, they're getting gynecomastia. Patients with metastatic prostate cancer, they're, they're generally elderly, right? And so these patients probably have pre-existing coronary artery disease as well. So you're actually subjecting these patients for a risk of a, a major adverse cardi cardiovascular event as well. So I think for a patient that has oligometastatic disease, I think PSMA imaging is, molecular imaging is, is the key here that we can actually pick up oligometastatic disease much better these days and perhaps target that. But I think Chad might have some opinions too. Yeah, okay. So for oligometastatic disease, yes, I think the better the imaging, the better your guidance is for, the, for our, our x-ray beams, the, the better that we can render the patient to a disease-free or disease-minimal state. Yeah. And I think Dr. Tan's point's well taken. I think that time off systemic therapy or time with eugonad testosterone is a very patient-centric endpoint that I think any man with prostate cancer would really much appreciate. So in our practice, we like to do intermittent ADT often, and using the PSA to sign a guide to when to take off the ADT, usually nine months or two years if it's intact, de novo, de novo setting. So I think a lot of interesting things there. And what would you consider to be a, a worthwhile kind of progression-free interval, right? So, so a guy comes in, three oligomets, you radiate them. Subsequently, he has two more spots, mm -hmm. okay? And, and is there an interval that, that you would say, this is too short, this strategy is not going to work, versus an interval where you'd say, hey, let's just radiate that again? Yeah. So. One follow-up is definitely too short. So if he's yeah. coming back to you in three months in the first follow-up and he has more mets, uh, you're kind of chasing a losing battle there. Yeah. But um, when it's longer than that, it becomes a more of a conversation about the patient. Like, what are their goals? And uh, how, do they have, how have their perceptions of radiation been in their prior rounds? Yeah. Um, often, they have <coughs> minimal side effects. So even if this, the chances are, are slim and as long as it's not re-irradiating it, um, they're willing to, to roll the dice at least. So it's a conversation usually. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's, to that too, um, a lot of times I feel like the, the Gleason 7s, 3 plus 4s, like for example, they have more benefit from that than, and, than a Gleason 10 that probably will have explosive disease if you play whack-a-mole with their disease, right? Yeah. Yep. Fair enough. What about, uh, uh, Evan, when we're talking about incorporating localized therapy into patients with, with metastatic disease, right? The, the metastatic hormone sensitive patients, where does that most apply in your practice? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, uh, the most robust data is the stampede subgroup analysis, right? I mean, we did initially have the HORAD trial, which was negative, but that was all kind of very high PSA, very high volume disease patients, and not surprised that radiation of the prostate was negative in that study. Uh, we had the stampede study where for the overall patient population was negative, but for the low volume disease subset, <clears throat> it was positive for overall survival and it was a pre-specified analysis. So that uh, is certainly makes it a more powerful analysis. <clears throat> what we saw uh, subsequently in the PIECE-1 study was is that we saw a decrease in serious general urinary events and an improvement in radiographic progression-free survival, not in overall survival. So it, it is a situation where overall we have more negative studies than positive studies, but I think it makes a lot of sense that the low volume disease subgroup would see benefit. Uh, I do think that there are other studies that are still ongoing out there, like SWAG 1802, which incorporates not only radiation of the prostate, but surgery of the prostate. And I think it's reasonable to think about SWAG 1802 for your patients. 
because the issue with SWOG 1802 is, is that it allows either radical prostatectomy, which has not been extensively studied, or with radiation and actually with more kind of more dealer's choice, but more people are doing standard full dose radiation rather than the alternative lower dose radiation that was done in Stampede. Not saying that you're necessarily <coughs> guaranteed better outcomes that way, but I think that <clears throat> for equipoise reasons, the definitive jury is still out. I think it's something I discuss with my patients that have low volume metastatic disease. Uh, but I think because there's a mix of positive and negative results, um, I think it's per per perfectly fruitful ground to enroll patients in a study like SWOG 1802 and really try to get more definitive data. Yeah, I mean, Jack, what about 1802, <clears throat> right? Uh, how do you talk to patients about this? What should the audience know? Yeah, so this is really a conundrum. So what's the role of local therapy in low volume metastatic disease? And I'm gonna put a little bit of a target on my head here. Now, I'll caveat that men with low volume metastatic disease, I send them to radiation. I very rarely operate. If I want to operate, I send them to SWOG 1802. But something that does bother me is that the limited data that we have that suggests a survival advantage with radiation is done with conventional imaging, particularly bone scan. And there is significant data out there that says bone scan overstages compared to PSMA PET. And so I, I think the real question is we need to look at in the PSMA PET era, so when we're truly detecting metastatic disease in its earliest state, is there a role for local therapy at that point? And is it surgery, is it radiation, is it both? Because I, I think if we continue to go based on bone scan, we leave this question up in the air of was that truly a bone med and they benefited or was that a patient who had a false positive and would have benefited anyways because they localized disease. So I think that's a real conundrum. There's a little bit of data for, there's definitely stronger data for radiation, there's a little bit of data for surgery. I think in the meantime we need to enroll on SWOG 1802, um, but also I think we need to be looking about how does the role of PSMA PET affect us in this space. So if I could add to that, so recently we presented our XMET meta-analysis um, at ASCO a, a few hours ago, and we did those 500 patients randomized to either radiation or standard of care, and we had a good 100-some patients with choline PET, 100-some with uh, fluciclovine PET, 70 with PSMA PET, and across the subgroups, the benefit MDT persisted. So although it's not level one evidence, there's evidence to suggest that even you stage better. In fact, PSMA PET was actually the best hazard ratio, and if you look at a point estimate. Um, so I think the, bet, and the better your imaging is, the better you're going to be for your, for your MDT. I, not saying the conventional imaging does have a benefit, but it may, it should, there may be a little bit more noise there. And also to another point about when we're doing local therapy for the, for the, for the primary, um, something that we look for as patients who had prior urinary symptoms from their primary. So I think this is from the PEACE data. If they were having, sometimes they presented and they needed stents in the beginning or they're having a lot of LUTs because of the bulky primary, we know that eventually we become cancer resistant. That's gonna be a nidus for, for progression. And I'm, Dr. Andrews probably could tell us better than anybody, but those are really, those are really intractable problems when you're cancer resistant. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and it's a good point because a lot of those patients may have very locally expansive disease and they may not be eligible for SWOG ATN2 because you have to be deemed a surgical candidate to be eligible for SWOG at 2 Although what a surgical candidate it is is a little bit subjective. I mean, I would just call Dan Lin and say to consider radical cystoprostatectomy and then you get the prostate out and the problem's gone. And, and, and it's, <laughs> and it's, then sur it's surgically resectable after six months of standard systemic therapy. Yeah. So you can shrink the tumor too and make them resectable. Yeah. I'm only partially kidding. <laughs> yeah. no, I thought, well, so, so we, you know, in the low volume metastatic disease, guidelines now include radiation, you know, local therapy with radiation. And absolutely, SWOG 18 is going to be important to give us that, that uh, the, the data for surgery, right? So it's, it's a critical data set. We have to enroll this study. But the high volume patient, you know, they're much more controversial. Yeah, we've got one data set from Peace saying, Look, it, it decreases it decreases you know obstructive symptoms in the long run, but it seems to me that what that data set says is the experienced clinician can apply clinical judgment, right? I think for the most part we can look at a high volume patient, we can look at that prostate, we can talk to them about the symptoms, and we know who's likely to get into trouble or not, right? And talk about either a surgical, you know, either let's do a terp or let, let's go ahead and send them to radiation. Do we have to radiate everybody? 
to get the PEACE-1 results, or can we just apply clinical judgment? What, what do you do at MD Anderson? Yeah, so um, I think we look at it for a few things. Number one, like I said earlier, if they're having urinary symptoms initially that resolved uh, transiently or, or resolved with ADT, um, that's one where we're worried that it's, it's anatomically there. Uh, bulky tumors on MRI or on imaging, we also worry about, and also small cells or other transformed uh, variants, we worry about because they can, when they progress, it can be quite explosive. Yeah. So those are the general features we look for.